like to uh, welcome Mr. Florian Talpisch on stage, who is, uh, of course, uh, one of the most famous uh, enterprises. Yeah. He, he insisted on having the red chair because it represents his company colors. So um, that, is, uh, that, is, that is great. So um, Mr. Talpesh, uh, of course, when I, when I researched a little bit uh, about you, I learned that you started your first very successful uh, tech company, Softwin, in, in 1990. And when I sent him the introduction, uh, he told me that I cannot say that just he started it. He said like he started it with his wife. So that was the most important correction I got. So that was, a, uh, that was a very, very interesting thing. Um, and that is now one of the biggest Romanian uh, software and IT companies and a great success example for the ecosystem and I think something for all of you entrepreneurs to aspire to. Um, but you're also a serial entrepreneur, so you also start a Bitdefender, which is a leading IT and security company. So um, I'd like to start by asking you basically, since you're like definitely the role model of Rom Romanian entrepreneurship, so, what were the advantages and disadvantages for you to be in Romania and to start a truly global company? Is it working? Yeah, it seems to work. Um, so, being in Romania could be an advantage or a disadvantage at the same time. So, you should play on the strengths and you should, let's say, be aware of the weaknesses we have. So, probably looking to, I ha had a meeting two weeks ago with someone from uh, the US investor space, and he told me that here in Romania we have an unfair an advantage on the, let's say, the technical skills and knowledge uh, people in terms of, and he paid attention to the, probably to the compensation and benefits packages. So, probably looking to, let's say, worldwide analysis on the payments. Romania is not on top, looking even to the IT people. So he stated that we have an unfair advantage. Okay. Uh, my answer was, is, was the following. They have an unfair advantage in terms of sales and marketing skills and knowledge compared to Romania, by example. And in our chat, during our chat in, during the morning, you mentioned that, that uh, sometimes you have to find, to look for yes. sales and marketing people uh, outside of Romania. So, so how, how did you manage to establish in over 100 countries distribution for your products, which is very impressive in talking about sales and marketing? Okay, so uh, in, in B Defender, we already have a very strong sales and marketing team. But during the time, and I remember, by example, six years ago, we used to have the head of global sales, the head of global marketing, the head of, the head of pro product management being Americans and located in the United States. That was uh, six to seven years ago. Initially, of course, all the team used to be Romanian. Now we have again the heads, these heads, being Romanian. So during the time, we tried to attract some time. We started ourselves and tried to attract some, let's say, skills and knowledge from the markets where you find a lot of skills uh, uh, and knowledge you are looking for. So we have attracted, by example, Americans, because myself and our team considered that in terms of marketing, the US is dominating the space and we attracted Americans to join the team. But use the Americans, so use these people to set up teams, to build skills and knowledge. And uh, my, one of my personal goals is to build such skills here in Romania. So answering to your question about the 100 countries, uh, my short answer is probably, let's say, 90 out of 100 have been targeted starting from Romania with Romanian uh, people, sales and marketing, and only less of 10 are, are targeted by what we call field teams, like sales and marketing, which are located in those countries. So your, your great advice to the young entrepreneurs in the audience is just to steal the people that you build up, because then you already did the pioneer work for them. Uh, it, it is not a straight message like uh, please come to, to recruit, but the truth, the, the truth is uh, 
finally, every entrepreneur is working also for the market. And looking to the startups, the startups are in the in Romania in terms of sales and marketing skills in, I should say, in a more difficult position. In the sense that the startups, at least in Romania, not necessarily have the funding to highly pay the sales and marketing top people. So they are in a, I should say, in a more disadvantaged position in Romania. Now the startups need senior and top people in sense of marketing. So it's a little bit uh, more difficult. So every entrepreneur working today in the space in Romania and developing any kind of skills and knowledge is working for the market because later or even later, uh, the people will uh, leave and will create their own companies or rejoin other companies, more challenging. Okay, and uh, through that you are in fact enriching the market. Yes. You are building the, the market of uh, skills and knowledge. Yeah, so that, that, that is very true. And um, switching a little bit to the other parts of the market that you're, that you're working with, with a lot of innovation. So I've, I've read a little bit about your company before and, and read about the Bitdefender box that you're bringing like a, a really a true hardware product, a hardware and software product to the market and really like bring innovation to the market, which I think is extremely crucial for the market here that we really have the skill sets to develop a whole product and not just like a service like people outsourcing or so on, but really developing the full product out of Romania and then marketing it globally. Could you tell us a little bit about your approach to like innovation, about the specific product and how you, how you developed it here from the local market? I think that would be very interesting for our audience to see like how, how do you do this from the local marketing perspective? What does the product do and how do you manage innovation? Before answering to that, I <laughs> should, let's say, uh, fine tune my answer on the uh, sales and marketing skills and knowledge shouldn't read my, my statements as in Romania we don't have sales and marketing, very strong sales and marketing people. What I'm saying is in terms of size of the sales and marketing market, it's much, let's say, smaller, uh, let's say, somehow comparing, normalizing with the US market. And looking to the technical skills, we know that, by example, Romania is on top, so you could find absolutely the, the worldwide top uh, skills and knowledge in, in terms of technical, but in terms of sales and uh, marketing, you have to struggle a little bit to find the ones. But we have excellent, also excellent people in sales marketing. Now coming to the question of the box. So your question is, how did we work the box or? Yeah, I mean, maybe you start introducing the product a little bit to yeah. the audience and then we can take this as a, as a case study on how you developed it, how you fostered that innovation yeah. as it coming from the top in the company. But maybe you start explaining the product a bit and then we go into the details of that. Uh, so maybe the, the nicest thing that has been said about the box was in the Wall Street Journal, uh, Wall Street uh, Journal analyst who stated that the box is a revolutionary product. And uh, following that article, I received a lot of calls from uh, US investors, friends, and so on, which has been somehow amazed by that statement, being a revolutionary product. So we started looking for uh, uh, an answer to the following question. So today, looking to the security space, we see a lot of devices which have, we name them closed operating systems devices, like uh, the iPhones or the iPads, which have a very limited security on top of them. So Apple has a kind of strategy which doesn't somehow, doesn't incentivize the cybersecurity industry to build products for the Apple products. So these are one, uh, this is one category of devices. And there are other things. And when I, you, everyone is using the Internet of Things name, it's about a lot of things a house has. Um, looking to some researches and to your country, Germany, uh, last year, by example, the average of Internet connected devices by, per family was close to 15 and was about the average nationwide 15 internet-connected devices by family. 
with the box today we, within our user landscape, we see also even more than 50 internet connected devices a family has. So when we talk about these things, we do not talk only about desktops, laptop, laptops or um, smartphones or tablets. There are markets, and especially US, Germany, UK, Japan, South Korea, in which the things have been, uh, have been, have penetrated the market. And we talk about things we think, by example, to TVs, and we see the smart TVs. Uh, I don't know if you know, by example, L, uh, LG had a feature in their TV, and you, most of the people are not aware of, of sending the information of the movies you're watching or you keep on your sticks or your, on your laptops or your drives connected to the TV. Sometimes you don't want to have uh, the LG, by example, or, or anyone else uh, be aware of what you are watching or what you are downloading from internet. Yeah, I, I can imagine that when you don't yeah. want to be aware that yeah. the, what you're watching uh, should be public. Or the camera. Uh, a lot of, you know, the new smart TVs has a lot of sensors, including cameras. And looking to the security of the camera, for you as a, let's say, audience of that TV, not to be monitored, the security is really weak. Okay? So this is a category of devices. But we talk about, by example, in the United States, we see what we call the smart hubs. So the average per family in the US is higher than in Germany of internet-connected devices. So a family which has a lot of devices needs smart hubs, which are managing the devices, the things we name. And, uh, we talk there also about air condition, which is smart and internet connected today. Why? Because you know the cloud is not only spreading, but the cloud is keeping intelligence. And most of the companies which build some intelligence about the user behavior are developing that intelligence, are building that in the cloud. So you need the device for the device to share for you in, in your benefit, the intelligence collected about different behaviors, okay, you need that kind of connection to the cloud. So air conditioning, very simple. But a lot of categories uh, uh, raised in the last years. And in terms of, let's say, things in the world, the researches today are showing that the things will be at least, let's say, four out of five devices will be in the world in the next five to 10 years. One problem with these devices is the manufacturers, the ones who are developing those devices, are very focused on building features, on providing value to the user. User experience, the nicest one, and so on. They are not at all focused on providing security. As I talked with Radu earlier, it's, about, it's something like you have a sign on your door, hackers, please come here later on, not today. Because today we are very focused on UX, on providing some good stuff to the users, but don't come around for a while. So these devices have no security, simply have no security. And looking to the landscape of devices a family has, you see most of the devices not being secured. By example, in the US, looking to our user base, we see more than 50% of the devices which have no protection. What do you say that the, low, the cost of a hacker penetrating the family, so hacking the devices or the family network, is really low, so it's easy. We don't know if we are hacked, if our, let's say, network, our router is used in a botnet to contribute to worldwide attacks. We do not know if our device is hacked simply because there is no sensor to monitor if we are hacked or no. Box is the first one on the market. So looking to find an answer to this question, how to protect the devices which have a very weak security or the ones who have no security, one of the ideas which raised was of a device to be installed at home near the router. 
So that's, that's fantastic, especially if the Wall Street Journal calls it a revolutionary device. That's obviously a big success coming out of the market here. And it sounds like you did a lot of thorough analysis of the market. But what I would be especially like, interested in is like, kind of the innovation culture. So did you personally come up with the product? Did one of your team members come up? And like, how did you structure the team around that? I mean, how was the, the, the genesis of that product within your company? So looking to be different in the teams we have, we should understand that myself, Florian Talapesh, I am probably one of the worst in the <laughs> company in terms of security knowledge, in terms of sales knowledge, marketing knowledge. The team has much more knowledge than I have, okay? And normally have much better skills than I have. So when it comes to the box, by example, the process was someone came with this idea, was a kind of brainstorming in the company. I didn't join that, so it was not me for sure. And at a certain point, the idea was raised, was let's say, uh, raised to a C level, including the CTO. We have a kind of, we have someone which is really very innovative, Bogdan, who's leading the older R&D team. And they raised that idea, that idea, and we, we, st we have decided to build a prototype. We have a prototype, kind of prototype in a few weeks. After a few weeks, we have decided to allocate a full team of five people. It's like a small startup within your company. Yeah, yeah. It, it's that way we are working, in fact. Uh, five people, including, let's say, engineers and UX, user experience guys. Of course, we have also a kind of hardware guy there, okay? Uh, after we build a prototype and we, we concluded that this is the way, we, let's say, we raised the team, we increased the team to 30 people. That was a strong startup, very well financed by Bitdefender. And to that team, we added also some industrial production people because it was about hardware. And we struggled a lot about, let's say, should we enter into the hardware space or not? Okay. But uh, we had enough arguments inside the company to do that. So it was about the freedom of the people to, let's say, come up with different ideas. And I have here on my left a uh, small team from Bitdefender Cluj team, which is a, an exceptional team, really excellent uh, skills and knowledge team, and probably we'll talk a little bit later about what kind of revolutionary products are they building here in Cluj. Oh yeah, that would be great. But let's stay a little bit more on the on the on the box. On the box. So, yeah. do you think that? I mean, we have a y lot of young entrepreneurs in the audience here. So do you think they would have had the, the same opportunity without the big company behind them to develop a similar product? And um, I mean, when you started with a team of five people, that's still manageable for a small startup. With 30, then it's already more challenging to get the funding. So how do you think, like, if somebody here from the audience would have come up with the same revolutionary idea, how would you, you tell them to, like, follow their dream and build that up? Yeah. Uh, first of all, we are supporters of very small teams. So in Big Defender, when you talk about 30 people, that means you have all the functions there, including sales and marketing, or marketing initially, okay? But we are supporters of a very small team. We really believe the innovation comes with the very small teams. Mm -hmm. And the speed uh, of uh, building a product, an innovative product, the speed comes with a very small team, teams. So in fact, if we talk with Bogdan Dumitru, our CTO, his strong belief is if you are larger than five to 10 in terms of developers, so technical people, you could be in trouble. It's kind of the Amazon pizza box theory. If you can't fit, feed them with two boxes of pizza, the team is too large, right? Yes. So it's about very small teams. And this, this uh, is very similar to the startups, in fact, okay? No. Coming to your question. So the, yes, these are startups. And our way to build, let's say, new products in Bitdefender is, in fact, to initiate startups. It's like Bitdefender is a bunch of entrepreneurs there. And this is, let's say, my style. But coming back to a startup, going to the hardware space you will face a problem of, uh, a, a, a problem of financing. You need some cash to work with the manufacturers here. So, 
And this is one of the weaknesses we have here in Romania in, in terms of, let's say, startups. The, still the landscape, the framework for, let's say, funding startups, which are high risk, is re it's, uh, still at uh, an early stage. We have some angel investors, we have some of them here in the hall, okay, joining this conference. The landscape is growing, but still in an early stage. So we, when you are, let's say, setting up a startup, you have an idea. Um, I should talk a little bit about the cultural difference between Romanians and, by example, Americans. I had uh, a few weeks ago uh, a chat with uh, one of the U.S. senior marketing persons, very, very seniors, uh, very, very senior, which used to work with teams located in different countries in the world. And my question was, what is the difference you have seen in terms of culture working with European teams, because it didn't work with Romanian necessary, and working with U.S. teams? And the answer was the following. In U.S., you, ha you got a lot of money when you have an idea, a lot of money to spend on marketing. So you start your go-to marketing even before having a product ready for the market. And the product will follow. is like you start the sales and marketing, and you fill the gap. You, you are filling, let's say, the gap of promises in six to nine or to 12 months. Fake it till you make it, how they call it in the US. It's, it's that way. But for that, you have to have the money to do the marketing. Okay? So you build the brand, you build the demand eventually, and you come up with a product. You develop, meanwhile, the product. In Europe, and mostly in Romania, we are used exactly in the opposite way. Sometimes here in Romania, we have the products. They are ready for the market, but still no marketing budget no marketing execution there, which is some very, very, uh, uh, let's say, opposite to what the Americans are doing. So we need some kind of financing here to invest in marketing. And if you are in the hardware space, to invest in the um, manufacturing. Anyway, the early the startups probably are compensating the, let's say, the, the persons joining with shares with, or with a promise of success, okay? But you need some cash when you are going to hardware on where you go to market. And this is a kind of weakness we have here. Okay, so we definitely all need to work on it and hopefully you'll also invest in some Romanian startups to close that gap of financing in the future. Um, but one thing that I want to talk about quickly about after like all the successes that we shared is, can you also share an example of any case that you like failed in a project with your company and the advice that you would give to the audience based on that? Yes. <clears throat> One famous failure we had was related to a product we named Clueful. So we are strongly believers, let's say, that the applications, the user uh, of the users, are part of the parameters we have to secure. So looking to iPhone, we are looking since a, a long time to iPhone, iPads, on how to secure. Have been many attempts in the market to secure, let's say, iPhone stuff or uh, iOS stuff. Um, one of our attempts was to look to the, what we call, reputation of the applications. So we started to look to what the applications we used to have on iOS's, the iPhones, iPads, are doing. And we became crazy when we find out what the applications are doing and the users are not aware of. Mm -hmm. So we started to build an application, we named it Clueful, and we launched that application on the App Store. Well, for you, some of you know, understand what means launching an application on App Store. Apple has a completely specific, let's say, word. You have to apply an, with an application, and you have to get the approval of Apple. You cannot have your application on App Store without being approved by Apple. And there is a process there. So don't know how the application went through Apple, let's say, approval process, and we got our Clueful on the App Store. In only a few weeks, you had 
close to one million users. And a lot of reception in the media, worldwide media. Very good reception. <sighs> the problem is, with that Clueful, we started to share with the users what the applications of the Apple ecosystem were used to do without the user knowing that. And that upset somehow Apple was pissed off by that. So you got kicked out of the App Store? <laughs> so they waited for our next update because when you are launching an, an application or anything in the market, you will go through updates because you get a lot of feedback from the market, a lot of feedback, so you are developing your product. They waited for our next update, and our next update, update was rejected. Never since then we had an approval for Clueful. So we have been kicked off. So you invested a lot of money and lost it due to Apple? Yeah. So what that was based, yes. And we, we, we are investing a lot of money, okay? So that was a case of a situation of you, we didn't well understand how Apple is working and the politics. And we didn't manage that. So we have been very straight. We assume that everyone will be happy with what we, we've done, but the, um, the bear was not happy. Okay. Yeah. So they kicked off. But once again, we learn a lot from that. And our culture is we have no failures. We have lessons to learn. Okay. And we learn how to work with Apple. By example, today Box, of course, has an application. We call it, uh, call it, call it a profile, which you, you download from App Store. Okay? But we know today how to work with App. But years ago, we had an opportunity, a chance, and we missed it. Okay? And that was a kind of uh, a strong lesson for us. Okay? Yeah. I mean, the, ones, the lessons which you pay most for are the ones which you keep uh, best in mind. So I think that was very helpful. So you mentioned earlier that you, since you have a team inclusion, you're building innovation out of that. Do you want to quickly talk about what your, what your local team here is building? Yeah, they are in dark on that side. They are, some of them are wearing this color, the red one. That's why I prefer that uh, red chair. <laughs> so <clears throat> you should know, because most of you are from Cluj, you should know that Cluj has really top. And when I'm saying top, that means worldwide, top technical people. And some of them are located in our office in Cluj. Uh, I am in the domain since 25 years, so I have seen a lot of people. And one of my questions I'm, I, I've been asked uh, several times is, do we go outside of Romania for recruiting, let's say, technical skills? And I said, we don't see a need for today. And that answer is still valid today after 25 years. So. The team there in Cluj is preparing something that we are considering revolutionary. And we got some kind of feedback from top people in the market, uh, namely for, from US, that uh, named that kind of technology as being ahead with two, three years of the market. So it's about, let's say, <clears throat> increasing the cost of the attacks. So the t today the space of the cybersecurity became very sophisticated, very, very sophisticated. We see a lot of, um, a lot of funding, a lot of looking to the attackers and to the ones who are protecting in terms of funding, in terms of uh, resources like skills and knowledge, there is no difference. It's about an industry which has been created to attack. It's really an industry. And you, f you find black markets, where you can go to uh, purchase a lot of uh, frameworks to attack and so on. So in this world, our, let's say, focus has been to raise the cost of the attack. And one of the ideas we had, and once again, that comes from the freedom that people have to come up with idea. One of the ideas we had is to come from outside the operating system with protection. Today, seems to be crazy, but the ones who are let's say, secure, protecting the stuff we have, and the attackers have the same privileges. 
because we are on top of an operating system, be it the Windows, Android, or any other one, and the attackers and the, the ones who are protecting have exactly the same privileges. It's like a game, and we, we got exactly the same tools. No privilege for the one who is protecting. So you're trying to raise the stakes for the attackers. So for that, we are going outside the operating system, and here the Cluj team came with brilliant ideas. And they did a job that no one succeeded in the industry and have been many attempts during the years to build some, something that is, let's say, technically called hypervisor introspection. So when, will you, when do you plan on launching the product? So we are in a, what we call productivization stage. That means we build the technologies, we validate the technologies, and now embed the technologies within products that go to market. And it's like in the Apple story, okay? Uh, you know, I'm comparing sometimes what we are doing and what the entrepreneurs are doing and what the teams are doing is uh, I'm comparing with the water. Sometimes when the water flows, you face a rock. You could just cross the rock. What the water, water is doing is flowing around the rock and is still flowing, okay? Sometimes when you are looking for, let's say, partnerships to penetrate the market, you don't get them at the right time. So you have to productivize in, so to embed the technologies and product and to target the market yourself, not through partners. So this team built, once again, brilliant technologies. We had some demonstrations starting with the second half of last year in US. They just, a team just returned from UK where they showed some technologies and they had some chat talks with some top people in the world of technology, and they convinced those, those people that this is the technology. And in our opinion, this will be a kind of paradigm shift in the cyber security, simply because it's increasing a lot the cost of the attack. And it's a very, very interesting thing. But all this stuff we are developing, so the products are targeting the business space. With the box, we have targeted the consumer ones and probably the small businesses with a, this HVI, hypervisor introspection. And once again, the, the team of Cluj should get all our applauses there, okay? We are targeting the business space. Okay, that's great. So I wanna switch gears a little bit because I'm, uh, I started my career as a hacker as well, so I was starting the biggest German computer security website in the, in the 90s. So I have, a, I have a soft spot in my heart for computer hackers. I was always a white hack, hack so I'd never like, hacked anything bad. But one thing that caught my attention especially, uh, since you mentioned also that now we're in a phase where a lot of people, they productize stuff very fast, they think about features instead of security when the development. And there was just a very famous development that famous people like Elon Musk, the founder of Tesla, Bill Gates, and even Stephen Hawking, they warned about the advent of like a killer artificial intelligence. They said like a lot of the things which we're dabbling around in the field of artificial intelligence have the potential to be very dangerous. Since this is like a little bit related to the security field, I'd love to have your perspective on, on dangerous artificial intelligence and if that's maybe also a field that you'd tackle from the security space. <laughs> First of all, so you mentioned Elon Musk. Uh, Elon Musk has not only Tesla, has only maybe, you know, SpaceX. He is, it's about ships. Okay, uh, travel in the space uh, cheaper than it was done. So we should be proud here in this hall that SpaceX, which is one of the top US companies, because Elon Musk is probably the, one of the most uh, en vogue entrepreneurs in the United States. SpaceX is secured by Big Defender. Congratulations. So all <laughs> SpaceX uh, <laughs> operations are secured by, thank you. It's about the teams here, okay? We should be proud of that, okay? Coming to the inter uh, artifici artificial intelligence. So looking only to B Defender is doing, we are using artificial intelligence since more than 10 years. Because let's say in the last 10 years, uh, w one trend we have seen in the consumer space, 10 years ago, you used to use a security solution and often your security solution was asking about an attack, a threat, a virus, and was asking the user of what should be done about that, okay? 
So in the last 10 years, the trend in the industry was to take off that uh, burden from the user and to build in the products. So the products should make the decisions in terms of cybersecurity. That meant to build artificial intelligence, to in embed artificial intelligence in the products. Today, what we have seen, by example, two years ago, the United States launched what they call the X projects, and was, was about uh, automation of the war. Automation of the war. That means the basic idea was we humans have a limited capacity in making decisions. That means in a very short time we cannot make a lot of decisions. Okay? So, and we are very limited in terms of speed. Okay? The decision was based on the fact that today a lot of the attacks happen, could happen in fractions of a second. And when, when I'm saying attacks, that means could be full infrastructure down in a fraction of a second. So you as a human have no time to react to that. And that was a kind of one of the drivers which led to that yeah. kind, those but, kind but, of But products. do you also believe like in dangerous artificial intelligence? Because you shared about the, the, the use of them in a, in a useful way. But do you believe that artificial intelligence can be a threat to? To us uh, as humanity, as they, okay. as they phrase it? This is a personal view. Of course. Here, okay. So when you talk about artificial intelligence, we talk about something that is, is beyond humans. So someone makes decisions and we are not aware of, which could be key decisions. The problem today, looking to the security space, is we see, like, you are not aware of, but one of the most powerful, I should say, nuclear weapons have been built by some governments. Yeah, US Stuxnet. and Israel, Stuxnet was one of them, was a cyber weapon. Millions of dollars have been invested in that. And that weapon can be used by anyone in the world. It's not like I have some hard time to buy, to purchase a platform to launch missiles or to buy bombs. Anyway, it's like it costs nothing to get there. That. So these kind of tools, which are very destructive, are in our hands, are accessible to everyone who has the skills and knowledge. So here comes, let's say, the problem. Looking to the humanity today, we don't have a common set of values worldwide like believing in one, two, three values worldwide. We see a very divided world today in terms of basic value set. And when, when you are, let's say, mass marketing these weapons, which are very destructive to anywhere, like embedding artificial intelligent, intelligence, is like you are providing these tools to everyone which has, doesn't share your value set. And here comes the danger. In my opinion, let's say, probably will not reach that kind of common set of values uh, within the next 50 to 100 years. Meanwhile, the artificial intelligence will develop a lot. So we see once again what's happening in, happening in the security, cybersecurity space. We are embedding more and more artificial intelligence there. It's about machine learning a lot, very sophisticated one. It's about correlating events. It's a lot of artificial intelligence built in the today's cybersecurity. And it's about the, uh, pro the ones who are protecting and the attackers. All the technology today is uh, available for both sides, and that's the issue. Okay. So in my, in my opinion, yes, there is a big threat there. Yes. So it sounds like it's a great opportunity for your company. So. Um, because in your space, if there's a big threat, then there's a big market opportunity. I'm always an optimist. I always see a threat yeah, as a market yeah, opportunity. Yes. So um, before we're going to our next speaker, I would like to also uh, have, like, what would you, in like, one sentence recommend to the entrepreneurs in the audience? What is the skill they should most work on? What's, like, in one sentence, what would you, like, tell a young entrepreneur 
based on, on your learnings as a very successful entrepreneur? Uh, we see different ways of building companies in Romania. And right here in the hall, there are at least two trends. One is a way of building a company, let's say two to three years. And once you get close to success, to get that company to the next, uh, let's say, team who will manage that company. It's like being a serial entrepreneur. Another way, and this is also typical for Europe, is to, be, to build family businesses, like long-term businesses. Myself, I tried and I, I, make this, I made decisions based on this purpose I have made critical decisions with our businesses. My purpose was to build a company which is going worldwide and which, who, which becomes a big time success to build a kind of reference, a model for the young entrepreneurs to show them that you can go worldwide and be a very, be, a very successful entrepreneur not only in Romania, but going worldwide. And in the tech space, that's the market, the worldwide market. So my message to Romanians is, once you are, let's say, start, starting a high-tech startup, go worldwide. The world is yours. I think that is a very great advice. So I think before we close, since the next speaker is still up, we have time for two questions from the audience. So we have a microphone. Somewhere I don't really see in the audience. I guess there should be a guy with a microphone. So we'll have like rather set up two questions. So maybe if somebody has a question, we can like take two, two questions from the audience before we close this up. So does anybody have a, so we start, yeah, we start directly with Marius in there because he's the only one I know by name. So he has the advantage of, uh, I mean, not the only one I know by name, but the only one who's raising his hand. So maybe, do we have a microphone here? Or you can, no, no, no. Come stand, 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 stand up and then give you give you a question. I'll repeat it for you until we have a microphone. Okay, I'll just repeat it for the for the audience. So Marius was asking, what was the biggest challenge in running the office from from Cluj? Uh, specifically in Cluj. <clears throat> okay. So we already have been aware, let's say three to five years ago, that Cluj is becoming the next next target in terms of high tech development. So we have been aware that, let's say, we'll see negative unemployment in terms of IT people here in Cluj. It's what we, we talked a little bit about, the unbalance, unbalance between demand and offer in terms of IT skills and knowledge. It's not only with Cluj. Cluj is the third city of Romania on the map. The first one was Bucharest, the second one was Timisoara, which became closed cities in terms of, let's say, recruiting IT people, Cluj became the third. The next one was Yash. Okay. So the biggest challenge for everyone in the next five to 10 years in Romania, and not only in Romania, when you talk about, let's say, something involving IT skills and knowledge, will be recruiting people. That's the biggest challenge. And that's why, by example, in Bitdefender, we are not recruiting generally senior people, we are working closely with universities. But the problem is more, uh, more and more companies are going to work with universities. So some companies will start to work with the high schools. Some companies will start to look outside of the, let's say, what we call IT faculties and go to, I, by example, philology. Okay. Not joking. So we, we'll, we'll start with kindergarten recruiting, then we are a step I'm ahead not, of you. I'm, I'm not talking about age, I'm talking about different people, but we, let's say we which have the brain wired in the right way for IT and recruiting and building skills uh, and knowledge uh, there. Okay. So that's the number one challenge. Okay. Then one last question before we go to our next speaker. I think I've seen a microphone now, so if anybody has a question, then raise their hand. Yes, oh, we have somebody over there. Yes. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, so uh, thank you. I'm uh, Radu from Eloquentix. Uh, one thing which I wanted to ask you is, what do you think the Romanian media and the blogosphere can 
do moral so, such that Bitdefender and other brands and yourself are pushed forward as examples of great made in Romania because Romanians always suffer from oh, we don't have any examples, and look here, I think everyone in this room is a great example of what a kid can become. So how can we push such a great company as Bitdefender to just be pushed for the Romania brand, if you like, and the Transylvania brand, or something unified so that kids feel they can do something awesome here, and that is a, a sentiment across the country. Uh, is about building that kind of sentiment or is how to work? So what, what the media can do to, to support success cases like this, uh, if I understand right? Yeah. You know, media is a private industry, so it's playing on its own rules, okay? I don't think you can influence a lot. What we have done, and probably you have seen last year in December, we, we did some research and we outlined the fact that Big Defender is not perceived by Romanians as being a, a Romanian-born group of companies. Right. So Bitdefender was perceived by Romanians as being, a, I don't know, a German, a US, any, anything, but not a Romanian-born company. Uh, why happened that? Probably we are at the roots of that. Probably we haven't been very bold in stating that. Even I'm, I'm let's say, promoting a lot Romania every time I'm going outside of Romania. So we, we did a campaign last year in December stating the fact that Bitdefender was born here. Mm -hmm. So sh it's like a model for Romania because it's a Romanian born, still controlled by Romanians, going worldwide and being very successful. So we tried to build that exactly for being that kind of model of oh, reference awesome. for Romanians. Okay. Th so, okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Talpesh, for being a great Thank role you. model. And so, of course, what I challenge anybody in the audience is that they should be 10 times more successful as you because you laid all the groundwork. So your challenge is like to 10x uh, what Mr. Talpesh has accomplished.